Hi, I'm Dr. Simon Freilich, Consultant in Clinical Neurophysiology. In this video, I'm going to explain a condition called Guillain-Barre syndrome, known as GBS for short, and its treatment. Let's first start with the correct pronunciation of this condition. Its name is taken from two French physicians. Whilst they weren't the first to report it, their description and diagnostic findings were so important that it was named after them. In French, Guillaume is pronounced as I'm saying it, with silent letter L's, and so shouldn't be mispronounced as Gillian or Gillian. The condition affects around 1-2 to two people in 100,000 and is caused by an autoimmune reaction. This is where the body's immune system produces antibodies to destroy infectious agents, but the specific antibodies produced also cross-react with normal cell structures within the body and attack these as well. This is called mimicry. This is why GBS usually follows around two to three weeks after having had an illness, which is often quite mild and may have just been a sore throat or even diarrhoea, and so the condition can appear to have arisen out of the blue. Emerging causes currently in the news are the associations with Zika virus and dengue fever, which are especially prevalent in South America. There have also been some associations with influenza vaccine, but it is important to emphasize that the risks are very small and influenza itself can cause GBS. Thus, the overall benefits of the vaccine outweigh the small additional risk. In GBS, the particular autoantibodies produced target nerve tissue, leading to damage of their structures. There are a number of forms this condition can take, but the commonest form attacks the myelin sheath that surrounds the central core axon wiring of the nerves. If you click on the iCard above, you can see a more detailed explanation on nerve structure and function and how we test these. As the nerve sheaths become increasingly damaged, nerve transmission can fail due to blockage of nerve impulse signaling. This process tends to start in the legs and ascends upwards rapidly over a course of days. This leaves patients weak on their legs and then the arms and may even be severe enough to cause paralysis. The spread of weakness characteristically peaks within the first one to two weeks, but may progress for up to a month. Longer than this would suggest a more chronic form of this condition known as CIDP. Pain is often a severe and defining feature, particularly in the back, for reasons still not fully understood. Involvement of the nerves to the diaphragm can also occur in around 20 to 30 percent and may cause impaired ability to breathe. If significant, this can be severe and life threatening, and so in the acute phase, this must be regularly checked with spirometry. Falling oxygenation and rising carbon dioxide levels might require intubation and artificial ventilation, and so a stay in the intensive care. The autonomic system can also be involved and may lead to dysregulation of blood pressure and heart rate. These also need to be actively monitored and treated. The diagnosis is usually made on clinical grounds and it is very important not to delay treatment whilst awaiting other investigations as the potential degree of nerve damage can be reduced by initiating therapy sooner rather than later. There are a number of subtypes of this disease with their own particular characteristics. The commonest is AIDP, or Acute Inflammatory Demyelinating Polyneuropathy. This is where the myelin sheath is damaged by the autoantibodies. This form tends to ascend from the legs. The causative antibodies have not yet been defined. This is the commonest form in Europeans. Because the damage is primarily to the myelin sheath, recovery tends to be faster than in the axonal forms. Hence, it's important to initiate treatment as quickly as possible to limit extension into these structures. The next, most important forms are the axonal varieties, where the axons which act as a wire core of a nerve become damaged. If this just affects the motor nerve fibres to the muscles, this is called AMAN, or acute motor axonal neuropathy. If it affects both the motor and sensory nerves, it's called AMSAN, or acute motor and sensory axonal neuropathy. These forms are associated with anti-gangliocide antibodies, which are picked up on blood tests such as anti-GD1A and anti-GM1. These forms are more common in South and East Asians. Because the wiring is itself damaged, regeneration can take much longer and is far less assured, hence recovery can be many months or even years, and significant disability can remain thereafter. A descending form called Miller-Fisher syndrome is also recognised. Here, the signals going to the muscles controlling eye movements are impaired, and this is called ophthalmoplegia. There is also ataxia, which means unsteadiness when coordinating muscle movements, particularly when walking, and also a reflexia, which means a loss of the 
jerks when the doctor tests these with a specially weighted hammer. These forms tend to be associated with anti-GQ1A and anti-GT1A autoantibody. There is also a very rare form known as PCB or pharyngocervical brachial variant which involves weakness of the throat, neck and arm muscles. This is mainly associated with anti-GT1A autoantibodies. There is also increasing evidence of a purely sensory form of this disease called ASAN, acute sensory ataxic syndrome, which is associated with anti-GQ1B and anti-GD1B autoantibodies. Standard investigations are likely to include a spinal tap to obtain a sample of cerebrospinal fluid. This test is used specifically to look for a raised protein count with a normal white cell count. This diagnostic change can take a few days to become detectable, however. The other important investigation are nerve conduction studies. These can identify and differentiate the demyelinating forms from the axonal forms by looking for evidence of slowed motor conduction velocities, conduction block and temporal dispersion. More of this is explained in the video card above. The changes found can often take a week or so to become fully apparent, and so this must not delay therapy. Early changes are often sought, such as loss of the H reflex, which is the electrical equivalent of the ankle jerk. The motor axonal form can be a little trickier, as there is a very distal demyelinating form which can masquerade as the axonal form in the first week. It's good practice to repeat the nerve conductions of AMAN or AMSAN patients around week 3, looking to see if there's been a switch to the demyelinating type. The benefit of doing this is for prognostic purposes, as the axonal forms tend to leave patients with more severe nerve tissue injury, and so recovery may take much longer and the degree of which is far less assured. With the axonal forms, anti-ganglioside antibodies should also be checked as detailed above. Let's talk about treatment, and there are two aims. The first is, of course, to try and limit the disease and kickstart recovery. This is done with either plasma exchange, where the blood is in effect washed out and cleared of floating autoantibodies. This is quite an invasive procedure, but relatively cheap and is quite available. The other method is using a blood product called IVIG, which swamps the autoantibodies and neutralizes them. This is quite an expensive treatment, but is easily given through a drip. Whilst for the most part it's usually fairly harmless and has a very transient side effect profile, it can occasionally be associated with very serious side effects, particularly in patients with IgA deficiency. It's most beneficial when started within two weeks of symptom commencement, otherwise plasma exchange is recommended as it has been shown to improve rehabilitation outcomes up to 30 days from symptoms commencing. There is no place for steroid treatment in this condition which have actually been shown to be deleterious. The secondary aim is supportive and rehabilitative. This means checking the respiratory system regularly with spirometry to make sure there's no deterioration, checking blood pressure regulation and heart rate, which is also very important, particularly in the rare scenario when the heart rate becomes too slow and a pacemaker might become necessary. It's important to provide appropriate pain relief to patients, particularly if they've got severe back pain, and preventing deep vein thromboses with special support stockings and blood thinning agents is very, very important. Active and early physiotherapy and rehabilitation programs form an absolutely vital part of treatment and should be commenced as soon as possible. This of course requires a multidisciplinary approach, obviously including physiotherapists, occupational therapists and nutritionists as required. Thank you for watching and I hope this video has been beneficial.